On World News Tonight, safe and sound, Malaysia flies home 121 job scam victims stranded in Myanmar conflict zone. Truce expires. Fresh fighting erupts as Israel resumes Gaza combat operations following hostage truce collapse. Stark warnings. Australian border force on high alert over fears of a new rush of asylum seekers coming by boat. And sunsets and guitars. Pharrell Williams and Louis Vuitton grace Hong Kong with mesmerizing music and a stellar runway. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin this week's final broadcast with some positive news for the job scam victims trapped amidst the ongoing violence in Myanmar. Scores of Malaysian job scam victims stranded in northern Myanmar as conflict erupted around them returned to Kuala Lumpur on a special flight from China's Kunming, reuniting with anxious relatives after months trapped in compounds where they were forced to commit cyber fraud. The 121 Malaysians, most of Chinese descent, aging from their 20s to their 50s, were brought together over recent weeks in Lao Kang, a town on the China border, besieged by ethnic armed groups seeking to wrestle the strategic point from the Myanmar junta. Since October, a coalition of armed groups under the banner of the Brotherhood Alliance have forced Myanmar's junta into a retreat across the swathes of northern Shan state after a shock assault. One of the operations stated that the aim was to close the scam compounds which have raked in billions of dollars from the Myanmar's remote frontier. Much of it was siphoned into the pockets of junta affiliates who until recent weeks had run the border zone with impunity. As the borders closed, scam compounds ran or relocated, driven from the border by a concurrent Chinese-led crackdown. Malaysians, Thais, Vietnamese and other nationalities were taken from across Shan state to Lao Kang to be evacuated via the China border. But fighting has gripped the town for over a week, with regular rocket strikes rattling the surrounding area, adding urgency to the evacuation plans. Security experts say the billion-dollar scam rooms are unlikely to close for good across Asia, but will instead relocate or adapt by using technology to reduce the workforce. Moving on to the Israel-Hamas war front next. Heavy fighting was reported in Gaza today as Israel's military resumed combat operations against Hamas after accusing the Palestinian militant group of violating a temporary truce by firing towards Israeli territory. This air raid siren booming across southern Israel early on Friday signaled the end of seven days of quiet. It sounded as a rocket flew towards Israel, said by its forces to be fired from Gaza in the hour before the extended truce with Hamas was set to expire. The Israeli military said it intercepted projectiles and accused the Palestinian militant group of violating their truce. And so, it said, it resumed combat, with the ceasefire ending at 7 a.m. local time. Smoke was seen over Gaza as heavy fighting was reported. There was no immediate comment from Hamas or claim of responsibility for the rocket launches. The return to fighting came despite urgent attempts by mediators Egypt and Qatar to continue extending the temporary ceasefire that began on November 24th. Hamas on Thursday had released eight more Israeli hostages under a second last-minute extension of the deal while Israel freed 30 Palestinian prisoners. That brought the totals of those freed during the truce to 105 hostages and 240 prisoners. More humanitarian aid was also brought into the shattered Gazan enclave, though deliveries of food, water, medical supplies and fuel remain far below what's needed, according to aid workers. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken did not comment on the resumption of fighting as he left Israel for Dubai on Friday. He said the day before, he told Israel it cannot repeat in South Gaza the massive civilian casualties it inflicted in the north. Next in Australia, border force and Operation Sovereign Borders intensified efforts to deter illegal boat arrivals after a recent High Court decision. A joint task force is formed in response to perceived increased activity by people smugglers, capitalizing on the release of 141 asylum seekers to lure more to attempt the journey. Border force taking its message beyond the seas. You will never settle in Australia. 
Commander Justin Jones warning would-be asylum seekers in two dozen languages not to attempt the treacherous trip. Authorities concerned people smugglers are ratcheting up their trade after a high court decision saw more than 140 non-citizens released from detention, some with serious criminal histories. The likelihood that criminal maritime people smugglers will manipulate that, that decision. One boat arrived undetected in remote northern WA last week, dropping off 12 asylum seekers before returning to Indonesia. This one slipped through, but Operation Sovereign Borders is a layered operation and did exactly uh, what it was supposed to do. All up, 273 people on 11 boats have arrived in the past 18 months all either turned back or sent to Nauru for regional processing. Unfortunately, the people smugglers are back in business. Over in North Korea, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ordered to bump the nation's military readiness against provocations by enemies as the US slapped new sanctions following a spy satellite launch from Pyongyang last week. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un calls for the military's readiness to respond to, quote, any provocation by enemies, state media said on Friday. Coming as the United States slapped fresh sanctions against the isolated country, following its launch of a spy satellite last week. Photographs released by the KCNA news agency showed Kim visiting the Air Force headquarters on Thursday. It said he also wrote out operational strategic guidelines to improve the military's readiness and war capabilities. On Thursday, the U.S. unveiled new sanctions targeting foreign-based agents it accused of helping Pyongyang evade other sanctions. Their U.S. assets will be frozen and Americans barred from dealing with them. In a statement, the U.S. Treasury Department said the joint efforts with Australia, Japan and South Korea, quote, reflect our collective commitment to contesting Pyongyang's illicit and destabilizing activities. The Treasury also sanctioned cyber espionage group Kim Suki, accusing it of gathering intelligence to support the North's strategic and nuclear ambitions. Meanwhile, Seoul said on Friday it had blacklisted 11 North Koreans for their involvement in their country's satellite and missile development, banning them from any financial transactions. The disingenuous DPRK claim. Earlier this week, U.S. and North Korean diplomats had a rare direct public exchange at a U.N. Security Council meeting, with both arguing their country's military activities are defensive. Pyongyang later called the U.S. quote, double faced for offering talks while ramping up military activities in the region, according to state media. North Korea's UN mission in New York did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the latest sanctions. Moving on to the road to the White House next. The Democratic Party has no plan B if President Joe Biden decided for any reason to halt his 2024 re-election campaign and a sudden need to replace him as its standard bearer would likely spark a messy intra-party battle. Hi, Joseph Robinette, Biden Jr. The Democratic Party does not have a backup plan if Joe Biden drops out of the U.S. 2024 presidential election race. Despite weak poll numbers and questions about his age, including from some in his own party, Biden has stuck to his plan to seek a second term. A senior Democrat told, quote, There is no plan B. If he were, suddenly not to run, everyone you'd know would run. The VP scares no one. The source was referring to Biden's running mate, Vice President Kamala Harris, who has her own popularity problems. Harris would not automatically replace Biden on the ticket if he stepped aside, and other Democrats would likely join the race. Democratic California Governor Gavin Newsom, who is not an official presidential candidate, has been particularly active as a so-called surrogate for Biden, taking part in a debate Thursday against Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis. The senior Democrat said the unusual move by Newsom was intended to remind Democratic voters he was, quote, out there as an option. Biden loyalists argue the party does not need a backup plan to defeat likely Republican nominee Donald Trump who Biden beat in the 2020 election and who also faces concerns about his age, as well as a litany of charges, 
including mishandling of classified documents and election interference. Even if more Democratic candidates were to jump in now, the path forward would be unclear, considering it normally takes months to set up a presidential campaign, and that deadlines to get on the primary ballot in several critical states have already passed, with more fast approaching. If the 81-year-old were to halt his re-election campaign, one possible scenario would be for Democrats to pick another nominee at their convention next August, or even later. Still, multiple Democratic officials spoke to admit the party could face upheaval and infighting should the oldest president in U.S. history drop out, whether for health concerns or any other reason. Welcome back. Over in Japan now, the country is concerned that the U.S. military is continuing to use its V-22 Osprey aircraft despite its request to ground them until their safety is confirmed after an accident this week. The fact that the U.S. military continues to fly the V-22 Osprey aircraft, despite Japan's request to ground them until they're vetted to be safe, is raising concerns in Tokyo. Earlier this week, an osprey fell into the sea near Japan's Yakushima Island. One person was found and confirmed dead, while the search continues for the seven others on board. The cause of the crash is under investigation. Japan's chief cabinet secretary Hirokatsu Matsuno on Friday aired Tokyo's concerns. As I said before, in response to the crash, our government, including the Japanese defense minister and the Japanese foreign minister, has officially requested the U.S. site to conduct flights of Ospreys deployed in Japan only after these flights are confirmed to be safe, except for search and rescue operations. Japan had asked the U.S. on Thursday to stop flying Ospreys, but Japan's regional defense bureau counted at least 20 Osprey landings and takeoffs around U.S. bases by Thursday afternoon. On the same day, the Pentagon said it was still flying Ospreys for now and wasn't aware of any official request for their grounding. But the Japan Self-Defense Forces, which also operates Ospreys, has at least suspended its own flights of the transport aircraft. Deployment of the hybrid aircraft, especially in Japan, has not been without controversy. Critics of the U.S. military presence in Japan's southwest islands say it is prone to accidents. But as a close U.S. ally, Japan hosts the biggest overseas concentration of U.S. military power, including the only four deployed American carrier strike group. Moving to South America next, the planet's biggest freshwater tank is in trouble. The Amazon rainforest, where a fifth of the world's freshwater flows, is reeling from a powerful drought that shows no signs of abating. This is all that's left of one of the largest rivers in the world. This tributary of the river Amazon, the river Solimois, has become a desert in places. The Amazon is experiencing a historic drought caused by global warming and the El Nino climate pattern. In several regions, the crisis is a humanitarian one. In Tefe, around 300 miles from the state capital Manaus, civil security officials install a water purifier on this boat, essential to the village's survival. It will collect and transform river water into drinking water. The water became so hot during the heat wave that the fish died on the surface. The water isn't fit to drink and has a horrible smell in some places. The boat is also taking food to more than 4,000 people. Residents of 25 villages like Hosineji Vashkis depend on this emergency aid. We're currently in a very critical situation. There are no wells or treated water in our village, so we have to drink water from the river. There have been cases of diarrhea, vomiting, even fever. But we have no choice. We either drink the water from the river or we die of thirst. The drought affects the daily lives of more than 600,000 people in Amazonas, but its entire biodiversity is also in danger. Since the beginning of October, the Tefe River has experienced a tragedy. The water has reached almost 40 degrees, killing thousands of fish and nearly 200 freshwater cetaceans, including the pink dolphin, an emblem of the Amazon. These teams who've been working to preserve these mammals for 30 years say it's never happened before. For them, the unprecedented environmental disaster is only the tip of the iceberg. 
The Amazon regulates the entire planet's climate. If we see these changes here, it means we are experiencing climate change around the world. The rainy season isn't expected until December, more than a month late. A serious blow to the fragile ecosystem. Faced with increasingly intense weather events, the Amazon is approaching a tipping point. There's imminent danger that a large part of the forest could be transformed into savanna. Taking the focus to the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, OPEC plus member countries agreed to cut oil production output in the first quarter of 2024 by 1 million barrels per day. The announcement was made as Saudi Arabia, Russia and other members of OPEC plus who pump more than 40% of the world's oil met online and issued the announcement on the voluntary cuts. The group of oil-producing nations known as OPEC Plus is cutting supply by nearly 2 million barrels a day beginning next year. The decision came during a virtual meeting Thursday to discuss 2024 output amid concerns the market faces a potential surplus. OPEC Plus, which is led by Saudi Arabia and includes member allies such as Russia, pumps more than 40 percent of the world's oil. The group's current output already reflects cuts of about 5 million barrels a day, aimed at supporting prices and stabilizing the market. Oil prices first rose on the news by more than 1 percent, but by Thursday afternoon had reversed course, with U.S. crude dropping by nearly 2.5 percent to under $76 a barrel. One expert told there is a high degree of skepticism on how individual OPEC Plus members will reach their voluntary cuts, going so far as to call the plan sketchy. He added that the UAE, for example, is supposed to be increasing production by 200,000 barrels per day by 2024. OPEC Plus is focused on lower output with prices down from nearly $98 a barrel in late September and concerns brewing over weaker economic growth in 2024. The 2023 United Nations Climate Change Conference, more commonly referred to as COP28, is being held at the Expo City, Dubai. Let's take a look. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. The UN Climate Summit clinched an early victory on Thursday, with delegates adopting a new fund to help vulnerable nations cope with the cost of climate-driven disasters. The deal was adopted following the COP28 opening ceremony in Dubai and already follows many months of negotiations. But some groups were cautious, noting there were still unresolved issues, including how the fund would be financed in the future. The United Arab Emirates will contribute $100 million to the pot, along with other countries contributing a total of just over $300 million. Germany pledged $100 million and the United States $17.5 million, with hopes the amount would build to a substantial sum. The early breakthrough on the damage fund, which poorer nations have demanded for years, could help grease the wheels for further compromises. Earlier in the day, COP28 President Sultan al Jaber, who is also the CEO of the UAE's national oil company, opened the summit urging countries and fossil fuel companies to work together to meet global climate goals. al Jaber aimed to strike a conciliatory tone following months of criticism over his appointment as the head of COP28. Let history reflect the fact that this is the presidency that made a bold choice to proactively engage with oil and gas companies. We had many hard discussions. Let me tell you, that wasn't easy. But today, many of these companies are committing to zero methane emissions by 2030 for the first time. And now, Many national oil companies have adopted net zero 2050 targets for the first time. And I'm grateful that they have stepped up to join this game-changing journey. But I must say, it is not enough. And I know that they can do much more. 
Over the next two weeks, governments will also debate whether to agree, for the first time, to phase out the use of CO2 emitting coal, oil and gas globally, the main source of emissions. Also on the agenda is what's known as the global stocktake. This is when countries assess their progress in meeting global climate goals. The main one being the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to well below 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 degrees Celsius. Welcome back. Viral AI chatbot ChatGPT turned one. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in this. OpenAI's ChatGPT became the fastest growing software application in the world within six months of its debut and one year on it has sparked the launch of rival chatbots. Migrants who left Tapachula in southern Mexico in a caravan a month ago arrived in the state of Veracruz where they were seen resting and recovering their strength. Gunshots were fired overnight in Guinea Bissau's capital Bissau and continued into this morning and the circumstances of the shooting remain unclear. Elon Musk unveiled the long-awaited Cybertruck price starting at over 50% more than the CEO Elon Musk had touted in 2019. Icelandic Startup Card Fix is the world's first CO2 mineral storage operator, permanently sequestering CO2 by mixing it with water and injecting it into Basel truck. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again next week as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we are leaving you in Hong Kong, China, as the French mega brand Louis Vuitton staged a mega-scale show in the Asian metropolis for a collection that explored modern dandy. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.